Well, and, and that's great advice because um, back in 02 or 01, when they started grooming, grooming me to run for the state senate, and I'm going to take that bit of advice. So uh, you may have heard, it's be willing to be the number one guy, be the chair, make, it, make sure it's your passion. Well, when they were grooming me to run for the state senate, this particular political party that was in power at the time, so we got to find you a border commission to be on. I was like, okay, fine. They go, well, you live in Norfolk. I go, yes. They go, well, we're going to put you on the Chesapeake Bay Advisory Council to the governor. I was like, okay, fine. So I show up, and it was very exciting. And so we sat around, and they, had, they asked you, what were your links to the bay? And my, mine was, well, I live in Norfolk. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> of course. Uh, you know, have you seen, it, have you seen it rain in Norfolk? <laughs> you know, Sorry. No that was my connection. Well, I was sitting around with a bunch of farmers who have nitrates <coughs> that seep into the bay and cause problems. And uh, I was with companies that fish the bay. So it was really an odd positioning for me. I was something I would have never selected. Now, granted, I'm glad I did it. I learned a lot, but it was just, it was not my passion. It was their passion because they earn livings doing that. So yes, by all means, that's great advice. You know, pick something that you're passionate about, whether it's the library, whether it's the, the museum, whatever that is, pick that passion. Um, I'm going to segue a little bit into um, the Honest Services Act, because how does that work in private practice? Everybody heard of Enron? Skilling? You've heard of Enron. All right. And I don't mean just the ballpark that had their name on it. Um, and, and as you may know, Enron had a bunch of executives that went bankrupt, a bu bunch of executives that profited and ultimately were, were prosecuted. Well, you know, they were prosecuted under part of their prosecution was the Honest Services Act. And who would think that it's a private company that they used it for? But what is interesting was when you read what the United States Supreme Court said, and how the Honest Services Act works, because it takes us, it segues us to where we are in today's current cases. What the Supreme Court says is this, and I'm going to read it. It's only about three or four sentences, but it's pretty important in understanding it. What they said is, unlike traditional fraud, because remember, Judge Campbell was traditional fraud. He was on a public record, right? Unlike traditional fraud, in which the victim's loss of money or property supplied the defendant's gain at one, with one, the mirror image of the other. Okay, so you had the fraud supplied the gain. The honest services doctrine targeted corruption that lacked similar symmetry. So while the offender profited, the betrayed party suffered no deprivation of money or property. Instead, a third party who had not been deceived provided the enrichment. Even if the scheme occasioned a money or property gain for the betrayed party, courts reasoned actionable harm lay in the denial of that party's right to the offender's honest services. Well, in this case, these guys were manipulating the stock. They were lying about their accounting, they were manipulating the stock, they were making profit, they were running with it. But so that gives you an idea. So you have the public official, you have somebody who comes along and says, I want you to do something for me, I need your vote. Okay? The people defrauded are us. You know, it's not money out of our pockets per se. It may benefit us in the end. It may provide tax dollars. But the person that's getting the gain is that, that other party that provides that money for that vote. And it becomes more of an exacting quid pro quo. So that's what the court was looking at when they were talking about skilling. And then they took that over to Governor McDonald's case. You want to say anything? I was going to ask you a, a hypothetical question. People just don't give money to political candidates because they like you. Um, that's why school members tend to raise the least money whatsoever. But where is the bright line, Andy, between the distinction between donating because you believe or have a predisposition toward development and doing what is right for the city of Norfolk versus 
giving money with an intent or an expectation of an affirmative act for you to do something as a result of accepting, say, campaign contributions. Second bar question, um, do you think that our ethics laws, which is now on the national stage and being used to hammer Tim Kaine, um, that the idea of just anything above $5, is that is it tra is, the argument is transparency is good enough. Do we need to do more? Well, first of all, you know, it's interesting because the segue then is to Governor McDonald because in the end, you know, was meeting somebody or sending up a meeting the official act? And we'll get into that, but that's really what you think about. When you receive a political contribution, uh, a great example was, was in um, Anthony Burfoot's case. Um, Dwight Etheridge, super fellow. He's in federal prison now, but he's a really nice guy. And Dwight was a developer. I'll never forget when I first came on council in 2010, one of the first matters that was coming along was this tie vest issue. And so Dwight says, I want to come by and see. Well, I'd been seeing Dwight uh, you know, in the building. He was a nice guy. And Dwight had given my campaign $500. Well, I didn't know really who Dwight was. I knew him. I saw him. I didn't know that he was involved in Tyvest at all. I didn't even know what Tyvest was. So Dwight says, I want to come by and see you. I said, okay, fine. Well, I don't know Dwight is coming to talk to me about Tyvest. And so he comes to my law office. I'm on the same floor with economic development in downtown Norfolk. We're on the 15th floor of the BB&T building. So Dwight shows up, he comes to my office. Hey, how's it going? Great to see you, Dwight. Uh, nice fella. Well, he starts to talk to me about his, his development and that he needs this particular vote. And uh, he had given me 500 bucks. So here's a guy who had given me, and I had just won the election. And I go, well, Dwight, I need to tell you, I, I don't meet with developers. I need to let you know that, you know that we can talk about anything you want, but I can't talk about that. I can't talk about what's coming before council because I'm, I'm not comfortable doing that. And I appreciate, and I remember the discussion, I appreciate your support during the campaign, but I can't, I, I'm not going to do that. Uh, t in fact, I remember telling him, times have changed. Um, <laughs> it changed me out of office six years later. But I remember telling him, times have changed, and I'm not comfortable doing that. So we can talk about anything. We can talk about football, but I'm not going to talk about Tyves with you. And he was wonderful. And he really respected that. And we never discussed Tyvest. We talked about a couple other things, and he left the office. So, yes, is there a certain expectation? I think that as you get into Governor McDonald's case, you'll see that he was receiving gifts. He wasn't putting them on his form. See, I had to claim Dwight's five hundred dollars because you know we list those as they're coming in when you're running for office. You list those, the gifts, whether it's monetary or not, and so you list those out, and. Uh, so it can be tracked by your opponents and everyone else. Well, I, can so I, can people I, I, could see that $500. But in the end, when, it, when Tyvest came to vote in Norfolk, I voted no. I was one of three council members who voted no, even though that particular matter passed. Um, but I will say this about, about Dwight. Um, Dwight ultimately was convicted in the Bank of the Commonwealth case, which goes back to Tyvest, which is something we can talk about in a little bit. I'll never forget, I was leaving Chesapeake Courthouse and had to pull over, because my work is either criminal or insurance defense work. So I had a conference call with an insurance company to tell them about a particular case at a specific time. Well, I'm coming back from Chesapeake, so I pull over on the expressway, right at the ramp, to make the call to Liberty Mutual. It was right at like 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock. Lo and behold, I'm on the phone, Dwight Etheridge had driven by. And this is after now he's charged in federal court, he's been indicted. I think he was awaiting sentencing at the time, frankly. And I, I'm on the phone with Liberty and I look down and I see a phone number. But I don't stop my conference because that was expected. In the end, when I finished the conference, I looked down and it had left me a number or left me a voicemail. So I played the voicemail back and it was Dwight Etheridge. He had passed me on the ramp and wanted to know if I was okay, if I needed help. 
so, and I'd always, you know, what a great character that was. This is somebody who respected me in the office as a lawyer when I said I can't talk about what you want to talk about as a councilman. Somebody who even after he goes to trial is indicted, charged, and loses awaiting sentencing, and he still wanted if I was okay. So, you know, is there expectations? We'll talk about Governor McDonald in a second. But I would say no, there is no expectation that you do anything. I think that you do provide an ear. I think the Supreme Court supported that. We can talk about that. But other than that, you, you, there's no other expectation that they should have. Do you have anything? I actually do have a question. You seem like an incredibly ethical person. I want you to run for public office again. Is this on television? Yeah. Does, shouldn't he run for office again? I'm sorry. I have never met a lawyer politician with such integrity as you. Um, but with that being said, what is the toughest ethical issue that you had to confront in your years of public service that you're allowed to talk about? I've already mentioned mine when I went, I ran out of closed session almost crying and calling everyone, state bar, hotline, wake up, Jim McCauley, please, please, I don't know what to do. But <laughs> well, I, I can't tell you that I really encountered a really tough ethical issue. I think if you, if you use your moral compass, n no ethical issue is very tough. I will say that, um, in, I'll say this, we built a new courthouse in Nauvoo, and it's a beautiful palace, and we came in under budget, did a great job, but what was neat was, well, not an e ethical issue, is that being a trial lawyer, I was in the courthouse just about every day, so when, <coughs> it, when judges complain to you, you want to make sure you take care of your judges. So if they complain that the elevators are too slow, let me tell you what, that call to the city manager's office that the elevators were too slow, that happened within 10 seconds of me walking out of chambers. So I don't know if that's really ethical issues because I always saw the courthouse and lawyers and judges as my constituents, um, regardless of whether they lived in Ward 1 or not. But I think if you have a moral compass and all of you do, because you wouldn't be here. Um, I think that your law schools have to sign off on your form that says you can sit for the bar exam because you're, you know, you're of good character. So you already have it. Um, so I don't really remember suffering through anything that really bothered me that I didn't proclaim at that time. There was nothing that really caused me consternation. So your answer is the elevators in the Norfolk Courthouse, is that what I'm hearing? Well, the elevators were, I, I may have acted quicker on that than anything else. So. I was like, that's a cop out. Come on, you know that. Yeah, no, that <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding. Go on for your no, next example. Okay. I like that one. Um, let's talk a little bit about Bob McDonald's case. Are you familiar with Bob's case? Do people know him personally? He really is a nice guy. He really is a super fella. And um, you couldn't get just a nicer guy to talk to on a, on a basis. And I will tell you, I had, um, I defend capital murder cases. And I had to deal with, let's see, Gilmore's administration, Tim Kaine when he was governor, um, and Bob McDonald when he was AG, through various executions. And Bob ran a wonderful attorney general's office, very professional, those guys were spot on, and they were good, and they were good to deal with, and Bob was good to deal with. But Bob ended up, as we all know, getting prosecuted in federal court and in Richmond. And what's interesting is, is that it was that Honest Services Act that we talked about. And so the question that came down in Bob's case was, and what went up on appeal, and of course the Fourth Circuit sees things very differently than most people, but when you look at, it really came back on the issue of what's an official act. Because remember you said, what's expected of me? Well, as long as I list out the gift, let's say it's a watch or a ride in a Ferrari, as long as I list it out for the state, it's covered, it shows. I've got to show it. In this particular case, Bob's issue was, well, what is an official act? And the court focused on that. What do we consider, is, is setting up a meeting an official act? Is that, am I receiving really anything back for setting up the meeting?
Bob's defense was, well, that's what governors do. We're, if you ask McAuliffe, he's the biggest, he can't pass anything because he says, I don't have the House or the Senate favorable to me. So my biggest job as governor, he tells you, is I've got to promote industry. Well, that's what Bob was doing in a way. Unfortunately, it was the person was a snake oil salesman, but still he was promoting industry. And that's really how you have to look at it. And so the Supreme Court really had this issue of, well, what are you considering an official act? If I'm on council and I say, I've got a friend of mine who wants to put a development in, I'd like for the city manager's office to meet with him. Under the Honest Services Act, when they prosecuted Bob, if that friend had given me some kind of watch or some kind of dinner or seats or tickets somewhere, then I too would have breached that act. And that's really what they focused on with him. And so the Supreme Court came back and said, and they listed out five things that really are not breaching the ethical act or that act. And they said, you know, setting up a meeting, requiring somebody to go to a meeting, um, listening to this person who comes to you and wants certain things, those don't breach the act. And that's ultimately why Bob's case got overturned. And it was really only fair that it really should have been because those are all things that the Supreme Court said that government does. That's what you elect people to do for you, to set those things up. So that really is his case pretty much in a nutshell. And uh, when they referred it back, they said, you need a better jury instruction, instructing the jury on what that act is, what the official act is. Any comment on that? Anything? Yes, ma'am. I have a question. Um, we all know there's a difference between the Constitution and the Constitution. So maybe, like you said, the Supreme Court said, You know, the, the great thing is, and I'll be very honest with you, when, when every six months when we fill out that form that says what we've received, I can't think back other than uh, we, we found out from the city attorney that when you received um, tickets to an event for fest events, that we had to write them down. Well, I spent like the first three years never writing them down. None of us did. We were getting a table at the beer fest we never wrote it down so you know then all of a sudden we're going oh my gosh well it's because fest events was a separate company from the city even though they, it was basically a monopoly running city parks so do you know when you think about it yes we look at it that way as lawyers but it's interesting that when you fill out that form it kind of cleanses you you kind of say well I didn't take any gift or I didn't go to anything so I I can honestly tell you, I never really worried about, and it may sound like an anomaly in public service, but I didn't really worry about whether I, it was an appearance of impropriety, because I never got there. Um, it never really affected in what I did. Um, I do think we're at a higher standard. I think that, you know, that your other boards and commission members will hold you to a higher standard. And I think you should hold yourself to that higher standard just because of who we are as lawyers. Um, when you're sitting on that board, you know, at the Library Commission, are people looking at you? Are you the only lawyer on the board? Okay. Do they look at you guys differently? Do they expect you guys to render opinions? Or is that legal that we, we burn this book and buy that book? I mean, do they ask you those questions? Yeah, and so, but I can tell you, I don't, I never had that, it never came across to me, and yes, ethics do cross into this, but it goes back to that moral compass, and as a lawyer, your moral compass is heightened, because I think there's a, a higher expectation on you, and you should be prepared for that in public life. I know you were going to say something, I'm sorry, I, I don't know if I answered the question, but. Yeah, I mean, it just seems like.
and I'm getting out yeah. for that reason exactly. Well, Chris, 48, remembers what I was like back in the Young Lawyers Conference when I uh, had like posted some of the most ridiculous things on Facebooks, uh, YLC parties nonstop. Yeah, I had to pay a couple, a guy a couple grand to get rid of all those pictures and erase stuff online. But when it comes to the appearance of impropriety, that is one of my biggest fears in elected pu in public office. I only have two and a half, three months left before it's all over. Um, and like I mentioned before, in the Conflict of Interest Act and also looking at opinions from ethics advisory uh, councils, it's one of the few areas where uh, you'll see the words, um, the interpretation of the act, sh you know, the words shall be liberally construed to the ends of this purpose. So in all things being equal, um, but, the, uh, but the fact of the matter is, is that um, it is difficult. And there are no bright line tests. And what he mentioned before about public disclosure, the reason why I quit my law firm, private law firm from July 1st, 2006, was a change in the rules of professional conduct uh, that required disclosure of the people who are paying for you. But anyway, I have a lot of different clients that are like, you know, multinational, securitized, different name recognitions, assumed name certificates in different jurisdictions. And if, and if I were to comply to the letter of the law requiring disclosure of the people who pay me, but also my law partners, I would also be giving away confidential client information. And asking the Virginia State Bar for guidance on this, they essentially told me, you got to choose one or the other. It's really difficult being both a lawyer and a public official unless you have the integrity of this man to my right. I mean, I really don't know what to do, what to say. Well, thank you. Um, but let me read you real quick um, what Chief Justice Roberts wrote about Bob McDonald's case. <coughs> and it's very short. It's uh, two sentences, three sentences. There is no doubt that this case is distasteful. It may be worse than that. But our concern is not with tawdry tales of Ferraris, Rolexes, and ball gowns. It is instead with the broader legal implications of the government's boundless interpretation of the federal bribery statute. A more limited interpretation of the term official act leaves ample room for prosecuting corruption while comporting with the text of the statute and the precedent of this court. So what they're saying is, you know, yeah, he got a Rolex, but you know, he really didn't do anything for it. Setting up a meeting or telling a state agency to do its job really wasn't what the bribery statute was for. And so then you kind of look to where we, we're going in today locally, you know, where you have an indictment of, of a former vice mayor and city treasurer. Are you familiar with that indictment? Which is really stunning. Um, when I was on council and it came down, I asked the city auditor to go in and audit, find out why there were mistakes, why certain things happened that this could occur within the city of Norfolk. So when you look at, in light of the Supreme Court's ruling, um, if you look at, and I'm just going to look at Anthony's indictment. And it talks about the scheme. Remember, you need a scheme. So you have, you have the act but you got to have something that moves the act forward, mail, uh, wire, something that allows this scheme to happen. In exchange, Burfoot performed and agreed to perform official acts. Well, remember, they were saying Bob's were official acts, including certain specific official actions and other official actions on an as-needed basis as the opportunity arose to benefit the individuals and their interests, the defendant and his conspirators took steps to conceal, conceal the scheme. And so then they go, well, what is, what is the official act? And then we're just reading the indictment. I'm not giving an opinion. Between in or about March 2006 and in or about December 2008, Dwight Etheridge paid Burfoot approximately $100,000 for his help in funneling projects to tie this, arising from the Hope Six grant. So. That's a very specific allegation. It's not just setting up a meeting, let's say, for Mr. Uh, assuming these are correct. You know, 
we're, we're, you know, we're at the demur phase, okay, in civil, civil work. Assume it's correct. So what they're saying is he did something so specific and got something back, that quid pro quo, something for something. And so that's different than McDonald's case, where in McDonald's case, he got something, but he really didn't do anything. Here they're saying he got money and he did official acts. Well, what happens if he didn't get any money and he had a chance to help his friend get Title VI? Does that breach the act? I was going to answer that. Um, the rules were recently changed, and I know that's federal, but and it was an application of state. Under this, the new 2016 Handbook for Local Government, the section says attempts to influence the performance of official du performance of official duties. It states, or paraphrases, no officer employees may accept any money, loan, gift, favor, service, or business professional op opportunity that reasonably tends to influence him in the performance of his official duties. And Section 2.2-3101 of the Act defines gift very broadly, and there's a disclaimer within the footnote. You want me to read the list of gifts? It's any gratuity, favor, discount, entertainment, hospitality, loan, forbearance, or other items having monetary value. It includes service as well as gifts of transportation, local travel, lodgings, and meals, whether provided in kind by purchase of a ticket, payment in advance, or reimbursement. But if he got nothing. After. Exactly. Let's say Anthony got nothing. Gift does not include any offer of a ticket, coupon, or other admission. I'm going to start paraphrasing this because it's too long. Any athletic Stop. event. Stop. Fine. He got nothing. He got nothing. Did he break? Did he breach the act? All he did was set people up to get some 32 homes or lots. If he got nothing, does he breach the act? What do you think? Answer is probably no. He's just setting them up to meet with city officials to try to get the 32 lots. Now, they have to prove this in court, that he got money from them, and then they're claiming that that's a breach of the act. It was nothing more than Bob McDonald if he really didn't get anything for it, if he just set them up to get the meeting. And, I mean, that could be a defense in this case. Did he, in turn, say in any of his forms that he got any money from this company? The answer is no. So we don't know that he's got money from this company if he really did. So you need to look at it in that respect. So it's, it's somewhat different than McDonald's case, and that's really what the feds are riding in this. And the fact now, if you add, you add uh, Ronnie Boone's allegations, again, it's receiving money for specific acts or specific votes, as I think was with the allegations. You can't do that if that's truthful. But if he didn't receive anything, and all he's doing is going and talking to the planning commission and saying, hey, you know, a friend of mine's got something coming through. I want you all to really look at it and give him, you know, benefit of the doubt. Sure, politicians do that all the time. So it's really receiving money in return, and that's really what the feds are going to have to really prove in this case. Yes, sir. No. I think that, remember, it's incumbent upon them when they receive your contribution, which is, which is unlimited. I mean, you can give to a council member unlimited. So as long as they list out that contribution on their forms that you give each one of them, let's say, $10,000, then you receiving that does not in turn make that a conflict. I think they have to list it out. But let's say they... Let's say that you give them $10,000 for their race, and then in turn, you give them 5000 for the vote. Now, that's, that's a whole other ballgame. We'll see you in Petersburg at the Federal Correctional Facility. Andy, can I, can I add something? Well, you'll probably get immunity. The other guy's going. Hey, Andy, can I add something? Sure. Are you familiar with VPAP? Is anyone familiar with yes. VPAP? It's uh, the, uh, if you go to, is it vpap.org? 
It's uh, the Virginia Public Access Project. If you ever are curious about how much money public officials are being donated, um, if it's in excess of what, $100 or $200? Yeah, $100. If it's in excess of $100, it will be there publicly available. Dominion Power gives money like candy and Halloween, and you'll know exactly where even judges, judges, it goes back far enough before they were elected to the bench, which judges paid which politicians for political contributions. And also, if you want to know where the political leanings of, say, you know, you're not only elected officials, but judges stand, go to VPAP, but look on, under the wives' names, too. Yes, um, that's true. Wives can contribute separate without the judge's name on the check. So you could get a um, uh, a contribution from the wife of a judge and it not, because she's giving it, she has every right to give it. Um, but I don't know if that's anything really nefarious. I can tell you that when I ran for mayor, I raised almost $300,000. And every single, mostly from lawyers, who were friends of mine. Um, even though I think I outraised my opponent, or one of my opponents, it didn't matter, you still lose the race. It's just how it is. Now, how do you get on a border commission? If you live in the city of Norfolk, go to the city's website. Find what your passion is. There's about 80 boards or commissions. If you're interested in the library, pull that up. If you're interested in uh, airport authority, pull that up. The botanical gardens, pull that up. And you can see who's on those boards, who meets. And you can actually fill out your application online. My next suggestion is, when the council determines who goes on a particular <laughs> board or commission, and if we don't know you, it's very difficult to get onto that board or commission. So it's nice to have what I call an angel. So if you say, I want to be on the botanical board, botanical gardens board, fill out the application. But if you live in, let's say, Ward 5, I'd contact Tommy Smeagle. Call Tommy up. Send him an email. Tommy functions very well electronically. I mean, he's, he jams all day long as a vice principal. But contact Tommy. Send him a copy of your application. Say, Tommy, I live in your ward. I'm a lawyer. Um, I heard Andy Protegiris speak, and he excited me that I wanted to join a border commission, and I'm so excited because I love plants. I want to be on the Botanical Garden Board. And fill that out. Co copy Tommy. Use, say you heard Andy speak and that he encouraged me to reach out to you. And what's going to happen is, copy that to the clerk of the council. And when you do, what will normally happen is, you will, when we get our binders, as the council sits there and tries to find somebody, and they will literally, will, they'll sit there, they'll go, they'll have ten names. And they'll go, we have, let's say, a vacancy. And the first question is, does any, at the table, does anybody know anybody here? And if the answer is no, and then we start going, well, let's, let's look at the applications if we don't know anybody. Or somebody will say, well, so-and-so called me, and, you know, I was really impressed by that person. Or if you're lucky enough, what they'll say is, Andy Predigero told me to write, then they'll put right there, even though I'm off council, they'll say recommended by Andy Predigero. Or they'll say recommended by Tommy Smeagle. And that person automatically gets it. Even though Tommy may never have met you, I may never have met you, that may be your entree. Yes? I feel like standing up, too, just to, like, you know, no I'm kidding. Um, there's another thing. If there's a meeting that's going on and it has to be publicly disclosed, just show up at the meeting uh, of, of anything. Like, uh, for example, Green Run Collegiate Board, it's publicly available. It's actually required by law under FOIA to make announcements when there are going to be more than two elected officials that are be discussing public business. And for example, on the school board, if uh, there is an agenda item that you want to talk about, we get lots of, I, I'll call them, like very interesting and colorful people who are on television telling us how horrible of a job that we're doing. And they get on television and we don't give them commissions or boards or seats, but if you're kind of nice to us, that's a great segue to to, you know, to be in a board, whether it's a governor's office, a state level office, or even a local office. And I also think Andy mentioned, too, that he has an open pack. So if you want to donate to Friends of Andy Progero, <laughs> that's, that's a fast I track. I closed it out. 
<laughs> All right. No, that's, don't give me any of that. That, that, that was a joke. I, I, I just want to see if he was actually listening. All right. Um, that's it. If we could, let's look at a couple things we talked about. So when you look at the ethics that are involved in this as lawyers, we can look back, first look at Judge <coughs> Joe Campbell's case. When you look at Judge Joe's case, that was the quintessential case if you do appeals and you didn't preserve it, that the interests of justice allow you to – you can throw that in and they may bite. The court appeals may bite. So that is a case where Judge Joe got nothing. He was just helping a friend and, he cons and it was considered that uh, because he forged a public document. Um, Phil Hamilton's case is the start of what we started seeing in the current cases where he actually got something back for what he did, and he negotiated it. So he got $40,000 a year back on a half million to Old Dominion to get a job. And that was kind of the start in the middle 2000s. Skilling and Enron, that be, they used the same act privately. And they said, you know, in the end, you really don't have to make any money. It doesn't matter whether that person made money or not. And then as you then transition it to, of course, Governor McDonald's case, they hung up on official act. We saw where that was the problem. So what is an official act for government to do? Basically, it's selling your vote. That really is what it narrowed it down to because so many acts that government does you know, are official. And then in the end, you saw the current indictments, and those allegations really had to be, one, did they get money, and two, was it for those official acts? And that's for a jury to figure out, including the most recent allegations of alleged payments that we really don't know. And those are going to be some great trials to follow. So I hope that helps you. I don't know if it did or didn't. Um, and uh, I know I have anything else to say. <laughs> so I know. I wanted to make sure I wrapped up appropriately. Do you have any questions? If not, we could probably cut out a little bit early because we didn't take a break on the first hour. I, I was going to say something. Um, I feel like that this CLE was a presentation that scared lawyers from ever wanting to, to do public service. Is, am I correct in that assessment? No, a little bit. Um, as much as I complain about being on the school board um, and the fact that I gained about 45 pounds since running for office, um, there is no greater reward than the sacrifices you make. And when people stop you at the grocery store to thank you for a program that you help push, Lawyers are trained naturally to think critically, where a lot of us are pessimists, but deep down inside of all of us there is a soul, and that we want to do the right thing. Because there's this mob mentality, in, especially on school board, where they say, you got to do, you know, it's like, yes, let's go name something, uh, let's go name uh, Kemp's Landing after Edward E. Brickle. Yeah, let's do that. Uh, and, and I just said, but we have a policy that says we don't name buildings after individuals at all, period. And so I got called the biggest jackass in the world. And then finally, oh, find out uh, uh, Edward E. Brickle was a segregationist when he ran for office in, in, in 20. And I'm like, who's the man now? I told you, let's just wait and delay. But I found a way around the policy. It was you can name a build, the, the building um, after the geographic location, which was a policy that was established in the 1970s. Yes, it was a dusty old book. But there's nothing stopping naming individual um, or naming a program after an individual. And that's why we have the old donation school at uh, the uh, Brickell School for Advanced Studies as opposed to the Brickell School or the Brickell Academy. That's the genesis of the name. I provide that example because a lot of attorneys are very smart, a lot, are very intelligent, and we need uh, people, and especially young folks, those who st aren't cynical and jaded like yours truly here, but who believe in the system of governance and public policy and not partisan politics, those who want to make a difference. And if there's anything you can take from the CLE, from what Andy and I said, I truly hope that each and every single one of you after the CLE, that you're not just here just to get that extra two credits for uh, you know, ethics, but actually go out and make a difference in the world because that's why I did it. And as much as I complain about it, I have absolutely no regrets in my term, in my four-year term in a public office. Any questions? Anything we can wrap up with? Anything? Well, I think we're good. I think we're a little bit short, but we kind of stretched it out. But thank you very much.